Thank you. Um, the one of the one of the ideas behind the original grant was about transparency and uh, information and costs. So these sort of very very important fundamentals in securities markets. And since, or when we first started talking about these ideas, uh, there's been quite a change in one relatively small area of financial services, and that is decentralized finance. And so what I wanna to present today is a little bit of a discussion and a preliminary analysis of a decentralized exchange. And one of the things that's interesting about this application is that the liquidity that is posted is completely transparent. The transactions are completely transparent. So there is, um, everything is um, observable. So uh, the way I'm going to think about this, uh, thinking about through this particular exchange is always in relation to sort of the fundamental unit that we always think about, which is an electronic limit order book. And um, uh, Larry G, who was here earlier, I don't know if he's still here, but he wrote this great paper about the inevitability of the limit order book. And the idea there was that the marginal participant in the limit order book essentially made zero profits just because of the structure of price and time priority. And because of that, the, uh, the open electronic limit order book would essentially be immune to competition because if the marginal guy is getting zero, nobody else is coming in. And so that was sort of a, that sort of shaped our thinking about limit order markets. And it's also been true that most securities, derivatives even, are traded on some version of an open electronic limit order market. So there's something to this. I mean, it's, it's a very, very robust organizational form. And the purpose of this paper is to take uh, a new type of market structure that is really only available in the decentralized finance world and to use it to see if, we can, if, if it can help us understand um, some of the costs and benefits of a traditional limit order market. So um, there's a very small theory, it's um, um, small literature, it's growing rapidly, um, but basically everyone is still sort of just trying to wrap their heads around how to think about this new area of finance. So what exactly am I talking about? I'm gonna focus my analysis on something that's known as Uniswap, which is a decentralized uh, swap facility. So it's a swap in the sense that any trade is a swap between asset A and asset B, same thing on Uniswap, which is comprised of many, many different pools that allow you to exchange two particular tokens for each other. Um, it's unusual, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a new innovation, but it's not necessarily a small innovation. Uh, first of all, it's growing very rapidly. And now we're in the, the zone where about daily trading volume is, is over a billion USD and posted liquid, liquidity is over 4 billion USD. So it's a uh, small relative to um, perhaps Elon Musk's personal fortune, but it's growing and it's relatively robust. What's interesting about this market from the point of view of microstructure people is that this is a new model of liquidity provision. And the new model is only possible because of uh, essentially the technology. So what is the new model? Let's just think about one of these swap pools. And suppose that you're trying to exchange uh, Ethereum for some generic token. Uh, Ethereum appears to be the numeraire good in this world. So that's sort of a reasonable benchmark. How does liquidity provision work? Liquidity provision works where people who want to supply liquidity, so passive liquidity supply, submit an equal uh, dollar value or equal Ethereum value of Ethereum and the token into this pool. So every time you supply liquidity, you basically supply on both sides of the market. When they deposit this liquidity, they essentially get a liquidity token. This is their receipt. When they want to cash out their liquidity, if they want to withdraw from the pool, they deposit that liquidity token and then they cash out the uh, Ethereum and the token in their current existing proportion. 
How are prices determined? Well, if for the zero trade price, um, essentially um, the ratio of the amount of both the Ethereum and the token in the pool constitute the price. For larger prices, uh, uh, for larger trades, the price is determined mechanically. It's done by formula. And what is the formula? The formula essentially says, if you change the amount of Ethereum in the pool, so let's say that this is positive, you've got to change the amount of the token in the corresponding pool so that the, the product of the two is equal to a constant. For this reason, uh, these types of automated market makers are sometimes known as constant product market makers. And this gives you a visual representation of what the, uh, the, price, the price impact curve looks like. So just to think through this, if you start at some point here, which is a certain amount of Ethereum and a certain number of tokens, you're sitting, sitting pretty. Let's suppose that the person wants to sell. So they're demanding liquidity, but they want to sell the asset. What's going to happen? Well, they're selling the asset. That means that they're going to deposit tokens into the pool. So the number of tokens increases, let's say, to T1. So what happens or how much do they get paid for that? Well, that amount is determined by the bonding curve. Oh, excuse me. That amount is determined by the bonding curve. In particular, the amount of Ethereum in the pool drops from E0 to E1, and the difference between the red line and the blue line is how much they get paid for the tokens that they've deposited. In this way, price impact is deterministic. Once you know the amount of Ethereum and liquidity in the pool, you know exactly what the price impact is going to be for a trade of any size. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is this is clearly a different model of liquidity provision from what we're used to with uh, electronic limit order books. And so, first of all, the obvious difference is that the price impact is mechanical given the pool size, and it's not chosen by the liquidity supplier. So nobody is strategically figuring out what price they want to supply liquidity at. Two, because the price is deterministic, it's just a function that everyone knows, Market reaches equilibrium, not in prices, but in quantities. So to some extent, this is a throwback to the old Schubik stuff, right? Um, it's, a, it's a different way of reaching equilibrium. The third thing that's kind of interesting is because when people deposit their Ethereum and the token when they want to supply liquidity and in re return get a liquidity token, essentially all the liquidity supply is fungible. What does that mean? That means that all the costs and benefits of supplying liquidity are mutualized across all the participants. One way of translating that back into a limit order market is essentially to think about this mutualization as being almost like a form of pro rata rationing. And this is not something that we see in markets. To some extent, it's too difficult to figure, in, to figure out who comes in first or we just don't see it. So the big question that we're asking, given this new form of liquidity provision, is essentially, you know, does it work? Um, if so, how well? And there's really not a lot of work on this very specific form of essentially rationing. Um, Larry, G, oh, gosh, Larry G at some point had a working paper on rationing rules that sort of talked about, well, what happens if you change conditional on price priority? What happens if you change um, the, uh, you know, first in, first out that we usually do, how do we want to think about how that affects market equilibrium? But this is not, this has not been a big area of study. So what is the framework? I mean, this is, this is primarily an empirical paper because you just want, kind of want to look at what's happened and see if it works. Uh, but how are we thinking about it? What, what's the structure? Oh, sorry. What is the structure? Uh, I've just lost my window, sorry. Um, I have it here. 
Oh, there we go. Okay, I got it back. Sorry. You were just saying earlier, Albert, there hadn't been any technological problems. Well, I just provided one. Well <laughs> Glad to help. <laughs> okay, so how are we thinking? What is the structure? Um, there's trade in an asset that evolves. And this is like the super, super simple sort of Foucault asset structure. What happens? So we start off at some price and the price can either jump up or jump down with equal probabilities. Um, so alpha is just the probability that there's an innovation. If there's no innovation, the price stays the same. And to make the sort of thought experiment really simple, we're in a world where if the asset either jumps up or jumps down, um, either the, uh, tip, uh, the person who can arrive at the market is an informed trader. So you can think of this as an arbitrageur. If the asset doesn't move, the guy who arrives is a liquidity trader. So the asset jumps and the probability of liquidity trade are gonna be sort of um, co-mingled, I guess, in this framework. Uh, everyone is gonna be risk neutral. Okay. So what is the difference between the two markets? Well, in a limit order market, the li liquidity suppliers are basically gonna sort of think about, think about how they're gonna supply liquidity. And they're going to trade off essentially adverse selection against profitable liquidity provision. They always want to trade against the uninformed trader, the liquidity trader, they're going to make rents. They don't want to trade against the informed trader because they know that in those states, they're losing money, they're on the wrong side, uh, their, their price is essentially, their, their orders are mispriced. And the way you, they compete is essentially by choosing their price impact function. By contrast, in the automated market maker, the profits are gonna be mutualized. So there's no incentive to compete. You're not picking a price because price is deterministic. The only thing that you pick is essentially the quantity that you supply to the pool. Um, so that's sort of gonna be the difference in thinking about these two markets. In terms of a timeline, how are we thinking about the world? Well, um, in the limit order market, First of all, liquidity suppliers decide essentially if they want to supply liquidity. You can think about them as thinking about whether or not they can take actions that are uh, competitive but don't benefit liquidity demanders. For example, by investing in co-location or other sorts of things that will give them an advantage over their adverse adversary but don't necessarily translate into better prices for uh, the liquidity demander. After they make that step, nature then alloc allocates them to a market. They can be allocated to a market either jointly or as a monopolist. They post their optimal orders. Nature then draws an innovation and then the liquidity trader or the arbitrageur trades. By contrast in the automated market maker, uh, the liquidity suppliers decide whether or not they're going to supply liquidity and how much, and they commit their capital to the pool. They commit their capital to the pool, and basically they're doing it so that it's ex ante optimal to do that. Then what happens? Then you either get the innovation or no innovation. If there's an innovation, then the relative proportion of Ethereum and the token are going to be slightly off relative to what is the new fundamental value of the asset. In that case, the arbitrageur is gonna go in and he's gonna essentially buy low and sell high and is gonna pick off the liquidity suppliers. So this is sort of adverse selection in this new type of market. If there is no innovation, then um, the liquidity trader arrives and they're going to trade and their trade is going to move the relative proportions of the, the token and Ethereum along the bonding curve. After they've traded, what happens? Well, after they've traded, the, uh, the relative proportions of Ethereum and the token are going to be slightly off. So, of course, the arbitrageur is going to step in again and buy low and sell high. What's kind of interesting about this is the arbitrageur trades even though um, there hasn't been an asset innovation. And this is essentially just because every time that the price, uh, the ratio of the 
the two quantities in the pool is off, the arbitrageur has an incentive to step in and buy the thing that is underpriced. So one way to think about that is in a limit order market versus an automated market maker, the total rents available or the total gains from trade are split differently upon the, between the market participants. Okay, so um, just to think a little bit about, uh, again, about the incentives of the people who supply liquidity. They face adverse selection in the automated market maker because they've essentially put in passive liquidity. And if there's information, if there's an information event or something is mispriced, then um, they're going to be trading at disadvantageous terms, right? However, the fact that there's a bonding curve essentially means that the amount that the arbitrageur wants to trade is a little bit attenuated because as you trade larger and larger quantities, your price impact is bigger and bigger. And so this is gonna sort of naturally restrict the amount that the arbitrageur is gonna trade. Okay. The other thing to notice is that in the bonding curve market, because you get a receipt for the liquidity that you submitted, and when you withdraw it, you get you cash in that receipt and get everything that's in proportion to what's in the market. Your the adverse selection that you face and all these other things are independent of what other people are doing. So you don't have an incentive to be as strategic as you do in a limit order market. So what do the data say? Um, so uh, when you have a new market form, it's always interesting to see whether or not it's actually robust and survives. And so what we do is we get a list of uh, two versions of Uniswap. There's now a third version, but we're basically gonna look at V2. And we look at, you know, this is publicly available on the, the Ethereum blockchain. So we get all the liquidity pools and we just kind of look at them, see how they perform. And there's a lot of them. Uh, there's about 40,000 uh, pools. Um, and we have, you know, about uh, 43 million uh, transactions. And those transactions are broken down into liquidity injections. So people are supplying liquidity, uh, people are withdrawing liquidity and trades of tokens. And we also have a series of very complex transactions and things like flash swaps, but that's a, that's a conversation for a different time. So what do the data look like? Um, okay, so this, this gives the trading volume in US dollars, okay? And this is over time. And this shows you um, the orange is the V2 that we're basically gonna be looking at. And this is uh, transactions against wrapped Ethereum. So Ethereum is essentially the numerator good on Uniswap. Um, it's sort of, that's sort of an interesting question in and of itself. How do we translate things into US dollars? Well, there's always gonna be an Ethereum US dollar price available at high frequency, and we transfer things into US dollars just for ease of comparison. Um, this reiterates again, the fact that most transactions are through uh, wrapped Ethereum. So this is just um, a uh, comparison of the different uh, types of pools. The edges refer to the volume. Um, so wrapped Ethereum, USDC, which is a, a stable coin, USDT, another stable coin. Um, and again, wrapped um, um, uh, Bitcoin. So basically most of the things are against stable coins. A so DAI is obviously another stable coin. Um, in our little sort of model and framework, um, when we assume that the market equilibrates um, in quantities, we uh, get an expression for the equilibrium quantity of any pool um, that will only exist essentially if the volatility is sufficiently small. And um, it's also going to be true that the equilibrium pool size is linear in the size of the liquidity trade, which sort of makes sense. The more liquidity trade there is gonna be, the bigger the pools are gonna be. Uh, it's decreasing in the size of the innovation and decreasing in the probability of informed trade. 
Um, we test this by regressing the pool size on price volatility and measures of uninformed trading. And it seems to be consistent with what we see in the data. Okay. Um, another thing that's very interesting, or I found very interesting about these pools is um, because the liquidity supply is essentially uh, passive, um, to some extent, the market structure is almost more robust than you might see in a limit order market where all the liquidity suppliers are strategic. So in particular, we, we spent a little bit of time looking at uh, liquidity withdrawals uh, during um, high drama events. And I'm gonna show you one picture, which was a massive drop in the price of Ethereum. So um, on May 19th, 2021, Ethereum dropped 41%, huge. So if you think about the- um, Ethereum uh, in terms of US dollars, you mean now, right? Sorry? You were saying Ethereum expressed in what, in US dollars? Uh, I mean, the yes, you can think of it expressed in US dollars, yeah. Um, the uh, October 87 uh, crash was 20%, so very, very big. So what happens? Well, um, this shows you essentially um, liquidity withdrawals on this very, very specific extreme market event. Right? So over here, you see the cumulative liquidity flow um, in a percentage of the pool size. And this blue line is basically representing um, 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 the drop, right? So basically we get a drop of about 17%, even though we had a 40% drop in um, the price of Ethereum, okay? So uh, yes, liquidity was withdrawn, but it was withdrawn relatively slowly. And the amount of liquidity that was withdrawn was much, much lower than you might pre presumably have seen during a, um, a, uh, a flash crash, okay? Another thing that we do is just to sort of compare it to Binance, which is one of the largest crypto exchanges. And we look at tokens that trade on both um, just to see, um, you know, how are they gonna, are they gonna compare? Is there gonna be a huge dislocation? Um, and there are sort of lots of reasons why arbitrage would be slow and a little bit scratchy between the two of them. You have to move things out of Binance custody. You have to move things onto a blockchain. You have to do all this kind of other stuff, but it's still sort of worthwhile looking at. The first thing to observe is trading volumes on um, have migrated from Binance to Uniswap on these tokens that trade on both. Right. So the blue lines are Binance trading volume and the orange line is Uniswap. And as you can see over time, uh, trading volume has migrated to uh, Uniswap, which suggests for these tokens, there is an advantage to trading on uh, Uniswap. The price impact, the measured price impact that we observe on Binance uh, versus Uniswap is very different. So the blue lines are the price impact um, um, on, on Binance. The uh, orange and the green lines are the calculated and the actual price impact on Uniswap. So this is also makes sense. Um, on Uniswap, if you, if you know what the volume is, that's the, if you know the posted liquidity, you know exactly what the, uh, the price impact is gonna be. So people can basically optimize around it. Right? Finally, a, a thing that we're all sort of interested in is um, you know, prices. And this is just one random day picked um, just to look at. And the prices on uh, Uniswap and Binance track pretty closely, right? So um, there's, uh, they, move, they move very, very closely together. So this suggests that um, there is obviously definitely cross-market arbitrage going on. Um, and it suggests that, you know, there, there's not a huge price dislocation. 
Okay. Um, just sort of drilling down more generally into price differences. Um, this looks at the relative pricing error uh, for Binance minus Uniswap in percentages, right? And basically, as the pool size hits about uh, 700, the pricing error goes to around zero. So basically, for extremely small pools, all sorts of weird stuff happens. But once pools hit a certain size, the prices track um, Binance very, very closely. So the markets are, are integrated. OK. So what have we done? Um, we've, uh, we sort of pre I've presented a little bit of evidence on the efficiency of this new model of liquidity provision. And there are parameters under which the automated market maker dominates. Um, and of, co of course, those are the, 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 the data that we observe are always going to be um, consistent with the parameters under which the automated market maker actually works. Otherwise, you wouldn't observe any of the pools. Um, the other thing that's sort of interesting is that this liquidity provision appears to be uh, quite stable. So um, essentially, because the liquidity suppliers are by construction, not strategic, they put the liquidity in and walk away. Um, that essentially means you don't get these dislocations where all the liquidity suppliers flee the market. Fleeing the market takes time. And so this is essentially like a pre-commitment to supply liquidity through states, right? It's, it's ex ante optimal. Um, and I think one thing that's sort of interesting is that there was this sort of uh, discussion that uh, the BaFin, the German regulator, has given permission for a company to start trading um, regulated German products on what looks like an automated market maker. So it's quite possible that something like this um, or some version of this, this type of market will be added into the sort of mix um, of the sorts of things that we have to start thinking about. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Christine. Um, uh, we're happy to have uh, as discussed with Haokshan Zul of MIT. Uh, th uh, thanks, Haokshan, for, for being here uh, today and, and sharing your, your views. Akshan, you're still on mute. I guess you. Is there a, a lot of noise on your side? You want to be stay, staying on mute? What's okay? So, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I, I just I just froze up, and uh, I thought, gosh, um, really to to follow Christine's lead earlier, and, and I did indeed contribute another technical glitch. Um, yeah. So so th thank you very much um, for inviting me to discuss this really interesting paper. Let me let me share the slide. Um, it also gave me a chance to um, to learn more about this really fascinating area about crypto finance and uh, in particular automated market makers. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. So when I first saw the so the title of the paper, um, I was like, oh, I, I haven't seen this before. Uh, there's another paper called decentralized exchange. Um, of course, exchange as in singular rather than plural. And uh, the paper is very different. But then I reminded myself that I'm in crypto land. So the right way to compare the paper titles is look, look at the hashes. And they are very different indeed. Um, so what this paper is about, um, it's about automated market maker mechanism on this um, exchange called the Uniswap. It is a Ethereum based um, exchange and trading, um, I guess, smart contracts, right? Um, essentially token versus not the token. Um, so Christy and the co-author, construct models of automated market maker, and also has um, <clears throat> uh, tested this in, in the data as, as well as the model book. And I think the, the bottom line they are drawing here is that between the two mechanisms, um, depending on conditions, one could be better than the other. And Christine in the talk has already um, kind of focused on the um, 
you know, basically the working mechanism of um, automated market makers. In my discussion, um, I would do the same. I think I, I, I find it's really fascinating um, that these uh, automated market makers have a purely deterministic price function and uh, people compete in, in quantities. Um, and I also share about what we learn about um, automated market makers, what are the advantages and disadvantages, and drawing on some of the research, uh, I guess recent research by, by some others, not, not myself, but some other papers. And uh, I have a few comments uh, interspersed uh, during that uh, discussion. Um, so what is automated market maker? Um, that, that's basically the curve that uh, Christine just showed. It is essentially uh, a swap between two tokens, um, two cryptocurrencies. Uh, imagine the quantities are Q1 and Q2. Um, there is a very mechanical price function that determines uh, the price by specifying that the quantities in the pool got to be equal, uh, satisfy Q1 times Q2 equal to a constant. Um, so let me just uh, give you one example using uh, wine versus beer. Uh, we are talking about liquidity, right? Suppose the liquidity consumer wishes to buy 20 bottles of wine. Um, if we ask the question, how many beers um, does the liquidity consumer would have to deposit in order to uh, get that 20 bottles? Uh, if you start with 100,000 and you end with 80 bottles of wine, and then X would be uh, how many beers you have to deposit, turns out to be 250. So um, every bottle of wine is worth 12 and a half cans of beer. Now, what if I want to buy 80 uh, bottles of wine? The semi calculation shows that um, every bottle of wine is worth 50 cans of beer. I have to deposit 4,000 cans of beer. Um, so the last bottle of wine is extremely expensive. And the uh, last drop of wine is even more expensive that even uh, Elon Musk cannot afford in this mechanism. Um, the mathematical form is, is fairly simple. Um, so here is the quantities Q1 and Q2. If I withdraw, remove X quantities, X unit of, of, of token one, let's call that a, a token. And I have to pay um, <clears throat> P2 units of cryptocurrency two. Um, so that's, let's say this Ethereum and the P would be the exchange rate, the price. And price is given by this function uh, and the price impact by, by this. Clearly, um, as X goes to Q1, the price and the price impact becomes infinite, right? That's quite unique. Um, now, I cannot help wondering what kind of design is this and, and who came up with this function? And uh, it doesn't fall from the sky. You know, the machine does not have its mind. Some kind of programmer put this in, right? So under what conditions would someone pick such a function? Um, so I thought, yeah, maybe let's try to think about this as a monopolist liquidity provider. And the customer wants to provide, uh, say, buy quantity Q of the token. And the customer's probability of accepting the price P is one minus some function, right? Um, so I'm trying to reverse engineer what this F function could be in order for that price function to be the optimal solution. Uh, you know, after some first order condition and so on, the solution is the following. It has to have this kind of exponential form. Um, so the probability of taking any price P Okay, um, if, the if the quantity is close to A, it's almost one. In other words, um, if, if you are exhausting the supply, then you are willing to pay anything uh, to, 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 to get a unit. I have a hard time thinking about, hey, what kind of micro foundation could be provided um, for this kind of price function? But, but that's, that's in, in a sense, um, the, the computer science, computer scientist problem, uh, why they code this uh, this way. Um, I think we talk about arbitrage, Christine spent some time talking about arbitrage. It's quite clear that uh, if the limit order price is different from the um, AMM price, then there will be arbitrage. And the volatility, uh, if volatility is high, then the arbitrage opportunity is higher. Then there's a subtler aspect from running uh, coming from the fact that when the cryptocurrency is uh, trade is confirmed uh, and yet not going on the chain, it's going to, to be waiting on some kind of uh, venue like a mempool. It's like a bus waiting area. The bus will not leave until you get the 10 people on board. And, and yet um, there's no priority, no, no time priority. So whoever comes in offering a higher, higher price uh, can essentially get onto the chain potentially. So there is a front running concerns. And I think uh, what, what Parker, Park showed is that uh, theoretically it is possible to make a transaction, make a round trip transaction from running others and still make profit. Um, so these are the challenges of the um, automatic market maker function. And what, you know, a natural question is, can you make it better? Uh, I think the, the, in the market, people have been, you know, also experimenting different kinds of functions, which, which is more, more generic. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, the product, but some kind of other function. 
uh, I guess Cobb Douglas is, is, is one example, uh, even though here it's called constant mean market makers. Um, your natural question to me as a theorist is what kind of function, price function could be micro-funded? Uh, if you think about the people coming with some kind of motive, liquidity motive, um, informed trading motive, and ideally you would want the market um, to be designed in the way that satisfies this motive the best. Um, so which kind of function is actually reasonable uh, in that regard? So that's one question I had in mind. Um, okay, coming to the liquidity supplier side, I think this is where things get, uh, in a sense, more interesting and, and I think it's more innovative. Um, so how do you provide the liquidity? Christine explained that essentially you deposit in the pool. Um, you know, if one beer is 100,000, uh, I could deposit 50 and 500 and to get one third of the share of all the revenues coming from the pool. Uh, just know that the trading fee here on Uniswap is 30 basis point. There's kind of a fixed exhaustion fee. And, and then there's a price impact cost, right? So whatever cost that liquidity demanders um, incur would be accrued to the liquidity suppliers. Um, so in that sense, it is not unlike a ETF creation redemption process. Um, <clears throat> so Christine pointed out, I think it's a very interesting observation that liquidity providers in the, in the automated market maker system uh, they do not compete as much um, uh, as in the limit order book. This is because they cannot undercut each other with price. They must compete with quanti quantity. It's, it's almost like quarter-ish competition. They can only uh, put in more liquidity and that's the only way to drive down price. And here price is the cost of liquidity. Think about this as price impact. If, if you translate the same idea into limit order book, then it's gonna look, look a little quite, quite bizarre. It's gonna be interesting though. Uh, it's, it's almost like a mergers of multiple market makers uh, on every ticker, right? So um, Virtual Financial and the Citadel may decide to merge on their uh, liquidity provision on the stock, uh, say Citigroup, and they cannot compete on price. They only compete on quantity. And moreover, they could do the merge on one ticker versus another. And, and the, the, the shares can be different. Partnerships can be formed and can be dissolved easily. Uh, so I think that's quite an interesting innovation. It's almost like a uh, shop joining a fast food chain and the headquarter decides all the menu, all the prices and the location merely adds to the depth, right? It has no say on what is to, to be provided and, uh, and the price. So in that regard, I guess the innovation there is really in corporate finance. And uh, here is the MA House of the Year banner for Uniswap. Let's look at the data. Liquidity on Uniswap uh, tends to be lower if volatility is higher. It tends to be higher if volume, number of trades, and reversals are higher. These are all very consistent um, with, the, with the model that Christine was showing. Uh, I have two very minor empirical uh, comments, I guess i just uh, look at this later. One is about standard errors. The other is to take the log, because uh, these numbers are quite stark. Um, Capone and Jia shows very similar results, uh, even though the sample looks a li little, right, much, much smaller. Um, the inflow into the pools are much lower if ex exchange rate volatility is higher, and the inflow rate is higher if the trading volume is, is higher. Liquidity stability. Uh, Christine talked about this in a, in a very positive light, uh, but to me, it looks like liquidity dropped uh, when price um, dropped as well. Um, I'm not sure if it makes sense to compare the fraction, um, you know, price drops 40%, therefore do we expect liquidity drop 40% too? I'm not sure. Um, I think this chart is also consistent with the interpretation that perhaps uh, because of the very convex price function on Uniswap, it's kind of expensive to trade on Uniswap. Therefore, um, there will be over provision of liquidity on Uniswap given how, how expensive and how, how high the price impact is. Um, at this point, it's useful to look at the actual transaction cost. Um, I'm drawing this from a different paper, Bob and Renato. Um, if you look at the four charts, what do we see? Um, the, the pink is Uniswap, and the orange and the, uh, and, and the, and the blue are the two limit order markets of crypto exchanges, um, by Binance and then Kraken. And you can see that the automated market maker system has much higher transaction cost um, for values below about $100,000 um, in, in, in dollar value. And that's a pretty large value. And these are um, basically log scales. So this number is not um, you know, 500, but rather this is about 300 basis points, right? You can see this is actually quite, quite expensive. Um, but once the trade size goes a little larger, you can see the bars become uh, more comparable. That's the first observation. Now, the second observation is that 
the automated market maker system has a V-shaped transaction cost. You can see that it's very high right here, uh, kind of lower here, right? And once it goes to very large transaction uh, sizes, uh, it become uh, higher here as well, right? It's V-shaped. Uh, but if you look at the, the limit order transaction cost, for example, track the light blue line, you see that it's kind of monotone increase in trade size. And that's sort of consistent with our intuition. Now, why does AMM has this V-shape? Uh, I think it's because of the proof of work then. Uh, it's almost like a fixed cost, okay? So in that regard, the smallest transactions are really not kind of uh, getting a great deal um, in, the, in, this, in this mechanism. And that has potential implications uh, all the discussions about the financial inclusion, um, you know, because you know, financially unbanked, for example, consumers are likely to trade a very small amount. So this type of mechanism so far does not seem to uh, benefit that uh, population that too much. Arbitrage bound seems to be decent. Um, you know, price track each other from the Lima order book and on the uh, Uniswap system, uh, but they are not in the exact lockstep, right? That's why arbitrage. Another type of arbitrage is this a triangular arbitrage. Now, triangular arbitrage is, is essentially uh, the same as the FX market. If you have a euro dollar exchange rate, you have the dollar yen exchange rate, then that would give you a euro yen exchange rate. Then you can compare this implied euro yen exchange rate to the actual euro yen exchange rate, right? To see if the price are different. Um, so the arbitrage bounds, you know, constructed this way or calculated this way, gives us a sense of how expensive it is to trade on the system. And this is again from the Bob and, and, and Renato paper that you can see that the arbitrage bound um, um, you know, Uniswap uh, is, is, is actually higher than the rest, right? So some of these numbers are quite stark. This is, uh, you know, 10% because this is, uh, you know, a uh, thousand basis point. And even for the smaller ones, it's uh, over uh, one percentage points. So, so it is still kind of uh, quite expensive to trade, um, in, in other words. And by the way, this is infinitesimal quantities, so it's not too much about the, uh, the huge uh, price impact. What about the comparison between uh, AMM and the limit order book? Uh, Christine's model uh, is mostly about either you trade on order book or you trade uh, through the automated market maker. And they find that depending on parameters, uh, one might be better than the other uh, for the uh, liquidity provider, sorry, liquidity takers. Um, their equilibrium is, uh, is mixed strategy on the limit order book. So for that re reason, I think you should cite yet a, a different paper <laughs> by Larry G. Um, by Rogan G. That's a flickering cold one because uh, they do have a mixed strategy equilibrium as well. There are two other papers that kind of look at this uh, comparison between limit order book and, uh, and AMM. One is theoretical, um, say, uh, <coughs> Ayagi and, and Ito. They model the, the parallel uh, trading between the two systems they make an interesting point, which is that if one increases the AMM liquidity pool, um, you know, this is a more general form AMM. If you increase the AMM liquidity pool, then that's going to be more attractive to inform traders uh, because of the convex cost on the AMM uh, unit swap is, is going to be uh, more expensive, right? In that sense. Therefore, if, if you kind of on the margin, make that pool a little more liquid, uh, it's going to be uh, more attractive to the inform traders. Liquidity traders do not expect to suffer from this, this uh, high price impact because their orders are more balanced. So you do see this uh, kind of asymmetric um, effect that the uh, Uniswap system might be more attractive to inform traders if you increase their depths. And that somehow, um, to me, seems to be consistent with this empirical paper uh, that finds that with liquidity provision on Uniswap gets larger, investors on Binance, which is a limit order book, become more sensitive to the Uniswap price. And, um, but, but the converse is not true, right? You get more depth on Binance, um, the user base increase on Binance, but, but there's no uh, similar ch um, change on the, um, <clears throat> on the Uniswap, uh, Uniswap, Uniswap system. So, so to me, that's kind of an interesting comparison between mechanisms with and without price discovery. Uh, I'll always be interested in the last part about <laughs> without price discovery, such as dark pool, um, but here is a mechanical price discovery. So I think some more discussion and potentially more work could be done uh, right here. Uh, just to point out that it is a fastly expanding field, and uh, these are the six papers uh, that I, I quickly browsed um, as part of the discussion in this paper, and I haven't even looked into all the computer science papers. Um, and if I may complain with my friend and co-author, um, Christine, that um, calling this decentralized exchanges doesn't really tell me exactly what the paper does, whereas some other papers did. <laughs> um, so, so hopefully, um, 
you know, um, the, the, the title could become a bit more informative later. So what's the takeaway? Um, to me, um, at least the automated market maker price function seems to be a bit arbitrary. It has some conceptual and practical challenges and the people are already onto this point um, extensively in the literature. And the mechanism in the data seems to imply fairly high transaction cost. So I'm not yet sure whether this mechanism or any proof of work mechanism uh, can really substitute the current mechanisms such as Beam Auto Book in the trading of securities and, and the derivatives. But what I find is really fascinating, um, as Christine pointed out, is that the competition or cooperation between liquidity providers is really of a different nature on this uniform Uniswap system. They cooperate more than they compete. Um, so maybe one final suggestion is that perhaps you can focus the, the next version of the paper um, in, in, in that direction. Let, let me stop, stop here. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Haoxiang, for this excellent uh, discussion. Uh, I'm so glad that you uh, unfroze and you could share all of this with, with us. Before I'm going to pass it back to uh, Christine, um, let's let's invite others to, to unmute and uh, switch on your webcam and come in with what your, your views are. Anybody? I have a question. Uh, um, how easy it is is it to uh, apply this to uh, to a non crypto application? Is this relevant for say foreign exchange with multiple currency pairs or triangles or something like that? And how how well does it fit into that kind of framework, or is it really limited to 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 crypto assets and tokens? Can I ask a question, Albert? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Then maybe Christine, you can make some notes and then in the interest of efficiency that you can take everything. Yes, go ahead, come in, Paul. Yeah, no, I just wanted to reiterate something that Xiaoyang mentioned in his discussion, which is, I think it's worth asking the question, what was the, the objective function of the person who coded this algorithm? I think it's worth knowing, like, what is that they had in mind? Who they were trying to reward and penalize by setting up this automatic price impact function? Uh, knowing that would go a long way toward explaining why some market participants are accumulating rents and some are paying rents. Right now, it's a black box. So it turns out that somebody coded this thing. It's a very popular market. There is billions of dollars worth of transactions happening every day. It would be worth asking, who came up with this? Is it like a college student bored in the middle of the night? Is it like a sophisticated uh, finance professor, somebody among the crowd here? Like who came up with this thing? Like we are taking it for given. We are spending one hour of our afternoon trying to figure out what's going on there. But I think it's fair to ask who is behind this, um, this mechanism, right? <laughs> Thank, thanks, Paolo. I noticed that Joel unmuted. You want to? Um, no, thank you. Know? Okay. Anyone else? Now is your time. Well, so Did Larry Christine, G's back off. It would, yeah. It would seem that the if you write the price impact function down in advance, it kind of has to be wrong. And so if uh, we could ask Greg at Citadel whether or not they would want to put their money into market making through a pool or whether or not they think they could probably um, make money arbitraging against the pool. And I'm just trying to see how this can sort of exist in equilibrium when it seems to me the price impact function ha has to be time varying and writing it down in advance can't be stable. Thanks, Terry. Craig, are you still there? The Citadel part of this? So this is Cromwell Colson. I, I think Greg's not on anymore. No, I'm, I'm on. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No problem. But so I think, you know, there, there's a question of did you, did you look at the gas fees through Ethereum too? 
in relation to the transactions because there's a big expense that is kind of hidden and, and you'll see in some of these areas is, is one question that I think that a, a second question is, you know, crypto trades kind of on a primal supply demand animal urges type market. And, you know, there's these fundamental outside events that take place, but they're more kind of animal urges rather than say earnings releases underlying earnings powers of, of that side. So, you know, the real question would be what happens when there's a real pickoff market, when, you know, there's a fundamental valuation. And there, there, was, another, uh, there was another thing that happened in Uniswap, interestingly called SushiSwap, which they took the code base, they set it up next to it, and they stole a lot of the liquidity pools. And that's an interesting piece. And then, you know, for the lawyers, it's going to be super interesting. If you're putting your money into one of these things, are you a broker dealer? Because you're regularly in the business of buying and selling, which tends to need a, a license in the United States. Th those are the things, I mean, I think these, these are all super interesting, but you, you know, part of distributed networks is getting the endpoints to innovate and do things differently where I just think this is the exact same matching engine formula for a bunch of different asset pairs. So it's not really a distributed network that Citadel's model is a little bit different than Virtu's. And I think that's the real powerful when you create a network-based market versus a matching engine is that there's different models at the endpoint who have a different pricing side. So you get a more powerful crowd to get to create liquidity. So th th those are, and that's, this is, that's from the business side of someone who runs a centralized matching engine market and a network market. Thanks so much for this contribution. Craig, did you wanna? No, so we, we, we don't really, we, we don't operate much in the crypto space. So I was mostly just listening and being fascinated by, by how this market apparently works. The, the only thing I would say, these were really more questions, and I think this was mentioned before, I, I didn't see any connection between blockchain, crypto, or decentralized or decentralized finance. It's just one, one can apply these exact same principles on the New York Stock Exchange or in any, and say, you know, what, what do we think about a particular um, model? And there are multiple models. So if you just look in the options markets, you will find there are uh, pro rata markets already. Um, where time is not is not in essence, it's strictly based on price and size. So size matters, um, and then you have your your price time priority. So this, this just seems like another mechanism. Um, and I, I think as Christine did, you know, let's let's evaluate that mechanism. It could be applied in crypto, but it pretty much seems that it could be applied pretty much anywhere. The the only one question that I had is was I wasn't quite sure where where does K come from? Who who determines? what that is because i once once that's fixed the whole entire liquidity pool moves up and down but where where does that initial value come from thanks greg um i guess this is a good time to pass it back to christina unless somebody really urgently wants to bring in it's something that we haven't mentioned yet um, can i just ask one quick question um if christine yeah. can give us some color on who is trading in these markets if possible thanks, Carol. that's that's very good if there is no other, I'll pass it back to Christine for the closing, essentially closing remarks of the, of the session. Christine. Thank you. Um, in terms of who's trading, we don't know. We just know the wallets. We can see the wallets going in and out. So we don't know who's behind them. It's all pseudo anonymous. Um, in terms of- We do know that Robinhood is a, ma a major broker, brokerage house for uh, crypto trades. Um, so, yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of the, the, the retail wallets are now plugging into, um, yeah, sorry. There's a dog going in the background, Larry Gloston speaking in the foreground. I'm just getting very confused. <laughs> um, so in terms of Terry Hendershot, uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 the successful trades are ones where prices are stable. Um, so we don't have, uh, we don't, see large pools 
um, with very, very volatile exchanges between where assets where there's huge volatility. So very much the, you know, equilibrium has manifested itself as relatively stable assets. Um, in terms of who designed it and where does the K come from, both those questions are sort of interrelated. Uh, the, the idea for the constant product market maker comes from computer science in the 1970s. Uh, they think that they can design things better and it sort of comes from there. And it was just coded up and people let it run and they didn't know if it was gonna work and it apparently did. So there's not a lot of, uh, once these um, things are up and running, there's not a lot of tinkering as management tinkering because it's fundamentally decentralized. In terms of K, what's sort of interesting is that K is originally programmed into the smart contract. And as more and more liquidity is supplied, essentially those curves shift out. And so K effectively becomes bigger and bigger. So even though there's an initial K, it becomes endogenous, right? At some point, there's a certain amount of token and Ethereum that are supplied. In terms of the gas fees, um, we didn't include the gas fees. We didn't include make take fees on Binance. We didn't include sort of the costs of taking things into and out of Binance custody and all those things. Um, there's a huge heterogeneity in, in gas fees, of course, um, on Ethereum. But I note that you have these constant product market makers that are traded on lots of chains that, where the fees are close to zero. So, I mean, you can think about SushiSwap, PancakeSwap, you can think about the uh, essentially clones of Uniswap that offer this similar product, but essentially like zero transaction fees or close to zero transaction fees. Um, finally, just in terms of the data, I, I think this is, this is a food fight that is now starting and it's just gonna get more extreme. So uh, there is no standardized data um, or there's no sort of uh, agreed upon way of analyzing uh, the blockchain data. So if you think about a data set where within one transaction, somebody can borrow a billion dollars and trade it and then put it back into the same pool, the question is whether or not you include that transaction or whether or not you don't. Because of the sort of uh, flash transactions and um, all sorts of other uh, sorts of things that we see in blockchain data that we don't see in uh, exchange data, it becomes very, very difficult to sort of understand, um, to, to directly compare numbers. So this is something that the, the, the literature certainly hasn't agreed on and hasn't converged on at, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and I think that's about all I had. So I'll turn it back to you, um, Thanks, Albert. Sir. And thank you very much, Harjong. Thanks all for, uh, for making this such a wonderful session. Uh, I learned, certainly learned a great deal and I always enjoy thinking uh, around new uh, emerging phenomena in markets. With this uh, uh, post the session, I'd like to pass it back to Charles to, to close the conference. Thanks a lot for uh, to all of you for being here. Thanks, Albert, and thanks for uh a very interesting session, and thanks for a very interesting conference. I'd like to thank all the presenters, discussants, and all of you uh, who participated with your comments and questions and uh, made this a super interesting conference that covered, I think, a wide range of interesting issues in market structure and, and transparency. So I'd also like to thank the folks at NBIM uh, who, uh, who basically made this possible. So their substantial grant um, has made a lot of this research possible and has made these conferences possible. And I'd like to really thank them for all their support of this kind of research. So with that, um, I bid you a, a very good weekend. Some of you are in the middle of your weekend already and some of you will be there soon. So, um, so thanks everybody and we'll talk soon. <laughs>